Hey guys, you know what's this right here? This is a streaming camera that I got to improve video quality on my show. Okay, many people rightfully said that video quality wasn't good enough in my previous episodes, so I got it to improve it. Okay, and this cost me a freaking hundred dollars, a hundred bucks. Okay, everyone who knows me knows how hard it is for me to part ways with money. Okay, I'm all about saving. I hate spending money. So this right here means I'm invested into this. Okay, guys, so compared to that, and again, this is a hundred dollars. How hard it is and how much does it cost you to just click the like button, right? Just click the subscribe button. Just leave a comment down below and just hit the notification bell. It doesn't cost you anything. So don't be greedy. Jokes aside though, this show of mine is all about normal people, simple people, guys like you and me who are trying to do something special in their lives and in their businesses. So be supportive, leave a comment down below, let me know what kind of content you would like to see more of. Without further ado, our guest today is Gabriel Spilt, an entrepreneur in the business of cannabis or more specifically in the CBD business. Let's go. Hey guys, today with us is Gabriel Spilt, a businessman who runs a CBD company called Plants Not Pills. Hey Gabriel, how are you today? Good, how about yourself, Misha? I'm good, I'm good. Gabriel, the most exciting part of your story is how you lost more than a million dollars overnight. Before we dive any deeper about you and your business, can you tell us about this part? Of course, yes. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's probably the thing I'll be remembered most in my professional life is losing a million dollars overnight. Hopefully not. We're still young. But um, basically, I, my business is Cannabidal. Uh, Cannabidal is CBD. It's the therapeutic component found in the cannabis plant. Mm -hmm. And on the night of January 6, 2021, uh, 20, 2020, I went to bed a very happy man. I had landed my first shipment of several thousand bottles of CBD oil in New Zealand. We were one of the first companies to go into New Zealand and actually land product there that could be sold in pharmacies. It was okay. the culmination of many months work, a lot of, um, a lot of struggle. I'd gone to our manufacturer in Eastern Europe. I'd overseen the whole production process. I signed off on the quality control and I went to bed on January 6th in my apartment in Barcelona feeling amazing. Um, and then I woke up the next morning with a phone call at four in the morning. And it was from my distributor in New Zealand telling me that five bottles had been found so far with the wrong label. So when you have a pharmaceutical product, what you put on the box has to match what's on the label. If you have ibuprofen, you can't claim something is 10 milligrams and on a different label inside the package have five milligrams. That's exactly what happened in my case. The factory messed up on the label. They put the wrong concentration of CBD on the label, but in New Zealand, in a pharmacy world, this is a huge no-no. So suddenly I was facing the worst professional situation of my life, which is called a recall. Now, big companies like Johnson & Johnson and Firestone Tires, they can, they deal with recalls probably once a quarter. You always read about tires being recalled. They also have thousands of employees and billions of dollars. I right. had neither of those things. So I was facing a recall that suddenly had overnight me fighting to continue selling product in New Zealand, fighting with my manufacturer over whose fault the labeling was. Because remember, I signed a piece of paper saying everything was perfect. Right. And basically being about um, a million dollars in lost product, about $250,000 in cash out of pocket. So I have to admit, it was uh, probably one of the only times in my adult life I had a tear in my eye, but I think every entrepreneur needs that experience. I was depressed for a good two, three hours, not days, until I realized that I had to start fighting for my life because no one else would. So, so to be clear, the whole batch had to be destroyed completely. Destroyed. Yeah, they burn it. They don't just, they don't, you don't get an option to even get it shipped back to you. They literally right. put it in an incinerator and burn all the products. So there's no hope. So I had to build a case 
to the New Zealand government as to why I should be allowed back in. Basically, okay. all the steps of the protocol, every single, and you know, I have to say, I had enormous help with my New Zealand distributor, who's a wonderful guy. And together, we fought like cats and dogs to okay. get back into the country. It took uh, six weeks. It took a lot of persuasion, a lot of emails, a lot of tests. Mm -hmm. um, basically, a whole restructuring of how I did business. And it was mm -hmm. the best thing that ever happened to me. Because I went from a person that was, I couldn't say I was disorganized, but I was a one man show. And I think that okay. that's where I want to take this conversation, if you don't mind, is we as entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs, we think we can do it all. And right. we really can't. We cannot, uh, we need a support network. We need to invest in uh, quality control. We need to invest in legal. We need to invest in some key elements, especially when you're dealing with a business that relies on um, you know, anything to do with people's health, anything to do with a pharmaceutical product, anything to do with a consumable good, because this is going to happen to you. Right. That's crazy. That's crazy. Um, now that we have this uh, out of the way, can you tell me a bit about generally about your background? What is CBD? How you came to this business? How do you do this business nowadays? Just a couple of words about your company. Of course. So Plant Snap Pills is my company. It was founded in 2014 uh, when medical cannabis became legal in Canada. So we okay. were one of the first uh, networks of prescribers of medical cannabis. We had physicians working for us, clinics that basically got people medical cannabis prescriptions for Parkinson's cancer, multiple sclerosis, uh, and severe anxiety, severe chronic pain. And we brought them to cultivators who were able to supply regular quantities of medical cannabis. Mm -hmm. the, the consistent benefits of cannabidiol, CBD, on people's lives, I wanted to put Plants Not Pills on my own product. So I went to, I started searching for manufacturers. I started researching about formulations. Mm -hmm. um, so what CBD essentially is cannabidiol is it's a lipid, a compound found in the cannabis family genus of plants. It's okay. particularly in high concentration in the hemp variety of, of, of cannabis. So okay. from the hemp plant, CBD is extracted and it can be used as an isolate powder, which looks a lot like cocaine for lack of a better example. And it can be used when um, bolstered into coconut oil as, as, a, as, a, as an oil. This powder can also be um, mixed with other compounds to create you know, what we call formulations. So right. what I did was I researched formulations. I sat down with chemists. I sat, I found an incredible manufacturing facility and started working closely with the uh, manager of the, the factory. And we created a line, a line of products that had Plants Not Pills branding on them. So uh, what we do is we take the CBD and we mix it with melatonin. We mix it with sexual enhancement formulas. We have uh, CBD and matcha to replace your coffee in the morning. What we've done is we've created uh, a, a line of 34 products that have CBD in them for a wide variety of conditions. And my first markets were Canada and the US. And since then I've expanded to Europe, New Zealand, and now um, you know, we're seriously looking at South America now that that's becoming more and more um, available and online. So for the past, since 2014 is when we started the medical cannabis component. 2016 is when I started the product line. It's been uh, five years of just expanding markets, selling CBD in stores, online. We sell it in physician's offices, dental clinics, chiropractors, physiotherapists, you name it, um, we go after it. So we are, we are um, a small but thriving brand of, of CBD in a market of many brands. But from a consumer perspective, right? I have never used it myself. It's not legal where I come from. It's not legal in many countries still. From a consumer perspective, uh, and I know you're working with many different levels in the supply chain, supply chain, but from a consumer perspective, 
what is it good for? I mean, what does it help with? What's, what's the benefit of CBD? So CBD naturally works with your endocannabinoid system, which is another um, system in your body that regulates pain, that regulates mm -hmm. your anxiety, that regulates uh, your hunger, your appetite. And CBD helps modulate all of those things. So okay. CBD is already produced by your body. Your endocannabinoid system produces cannabinoids. So oh. in a way, it's a nutraceutical. It's a supplement. You're giving your body more of what it needs. And in, in, um, in, in plain terms, you're able to alleviate chronic pains. You're able mm -hmm. to alleviate depression, anxiety. Um, and the biggest thing too, for most people is sleep and, um, and, and, and really anxiety. Anxiety has now become one of the number one uh, disorders of our generation, um, mm -hmm. speaking for myself um, included. And CBD really helps modulate, um, you know, all signals sent to the nervous system, um, you know, um, neurotransmitters from the brain. A lot of these, uh, these signals that we're sending, CBD helps basically um, slow down, modulate, and uh, in some cases, stop completely, um, you know, certain pain signals, for example, your brain would send to the rest of your body. So it's um, basically for many people taking replacement, as the name of our company says, of opioids, painkillers, antidepressants. Uh, and I have to say, most of our consumers uh, are religious about it. They take their CBD every day. Uh, and they take it in the morning. They take it in the evening and they report better sleep. They report better health in general, less pain, less inflammation. It's, a, it's an anti-inflammatory and mm -hmm. a general be better quality of life. And normally, like in the US or Canada, uh, do you need a prescription for something like that? Or do you just go and buy whenever you feel like? Well, the beauty about the US is that it's considered OTC, over the counter. So okay. it's... It doesn't have yet a legal status. It's considered somewhere in between a supplement and a nutraceutical. So in most states, there's only two states where there are stricter legislations. Um, but this has also changed. It's now it's it's now basically accepted in, in almost all 50 states. So okay. you can uh, sell it freely. Um, I mean, many big chains now sell it. Pharmacies like CVS offers CBD. It's become a mainstream product. And okay. the beauty about that is, though it opens up countless opportunities, it also turns the product into a commodity. And when a product mm -hmm. is a commodity, your best um, advantage is to compete on price and quality. And I think that we've really cornered the market on super affordable CBD product and mm -hmm. the highest quality reflecting that price point. So it's, um, it's definitely a, an emerging market. It's a global market. And it's a, it's a growing market. Is it something you can easily become addicted to? I mean, would you, would you yourself take it on a daily basis? Would you recommend it to your friends or your mother? I do. I take it on a daily basis. I have my oil. I take it in okay. the morning, in the evening. I take it when I feel anxiety, when I can't okay. sleep. Um, okay. And it's, it's, I mean, it's not addicting, but it's uh it's the same thing as saying, are you addicted to your vitamin C tablets? Are you addicted to your magnesium? I mean, it, it really, I believe it falls in that category of your daily care routine. And for everyone right. that's different. So we all have a daily care routine, but I think more than ever, we're becoming so conscious of what we put in our bodies that this only makes sense. There's no proven um, long-term negative effects so far. Um, there's very few indications, contraindications with medications, so it can be mm -hmm. taken with medications as well. And in some cases, and I'm by no means a doctor, but in speaking with many physicians and many, many of our clients, it's replaced medications. So I, 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 I'm a believer because I, I've seen now seven years in the cannabis industry, um, we have 45 years of clinical research that it is incredibly beneficial on a number of organ systems. Okay, that's, that's uh, interesting. You're based in Barcelona, but you're originally from Canada and you have suppliers in the US and in Eastern Europe and yet you ship globally. I mean, 
from a paperwork standpoint, from, from the legal standpoint, this must be a nightmare, isn't it? It is, a, it, it can be, but what I've also learned is uh, delegate and, and no, you're not good at everything. So I, I learned very quickly and this I took advice from another uh, entrepreneur. I really uh, like Sarah Blakely. She told me hire your weaknesses. And I think okay. that that's kind of what I've done, um, but I've gone a step further. Anyone who buys from me that wants to import my products into the country, mm -hmm. that is their territory. Um, my responsibility ends when the, the shipment leaves the factory. What happens in transit and when it lands in the country, aside from obviously labeling boxes, any sort of import regulation, I leave to my distributors. And I okay. think that that's, that's also when you're trying to make your first deals, probably in any consumable goods industry, you're going to try to promise the world and you're going to try to say, we'll help you with that. And yes, we, we, we know that legislation. Yes, we No, you don't. The person in the country who's interested in your product, that's their responsibility and it should be their responsibility. So yes, it can be a nightmare, but it's not my nightmare anymore. So, um, so that's, that's, and that's, that's the way I'm, I've become a much happier person. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a nice piece of advice for entrepreneurial mm -hmm. happiness, so to speak. Um, yeah, well, and give others the responsibility. You don't, you don't, you don't, you're not responsible for everyone else. I think from a procedure standpoint, your business is probably close to as hard as it gets, or it might mm. be close to that. So, so your point of view is definitely very, very valuable in that. Um, I didn't know CBD for pets is a thing. Can you tell me a little bit about that? And how did you potentially, I know you have dogs. Uh, how did you, how did you find it uh, using with animals? Well, I'd been following studies with pets since I got into the industry. And actually we've been hearing about CBD and pets since as far back as the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. So, um, and it makes perfect sense. And, all mammals have the same endocannabinoid system. So uh, the way we react to CBD is the same way my dog will react to CBD. Of okay. course, because they're smaller creatures, they will be more sensitive. So they need less concentrations. I would not give my dog the same amount of CBD I give myself. It, it's not harmful. They cannot, I've never heard of a case of a dog overdosing or dying. They'll just go to sleep for a long time. <laughs> okay. They'll wake up and they'll be fine. Um, but basically what we've seen is that there has been a handful of studies, probably about 12 important studies worldwide on the effects of CBD on canines um, and also felines, but mostly canines. And what they found is that when it came to reducing inflammation, when it came to osteoarthritis in older animals, when it came to cancer, uh, pain relief and stimulation of appetite, CBD had an incredible success rate when, when tested in the cohorts that it was tested on. Mm -hmm. So it was a passion of mine because I had aging dogs and anyone who has an aging dog, an old Labrador, or, you know, your heart breaks because there's, you want to, they're your children, they're your family, you want to do everything for them. And at the same time, you are put in a cycle with the veterinarians of constantly needing to give them this drug, that drug, which are very expensive and also have horrible side effects. So the side effects, you know, can be anything from loss of bladder control, loss of mobility. Um, you're basically just keeping a, a dog in a vegetative state, you know, right. alive. So with CBD, when I started using it on my animals, because I would never recommend something I don't use myself or I don't use on my own. Mm -hmm. um, I saw the noticeable impact. We had a 13-year-old Labrador, Scooby-Doo, mm -hmm. chocolate lab, who mm -hmm. the improvement was almost immediate. He was eating again. He was walking again after oh. being in an almost comatose state. And it extended his lifespan. Eventually, he did pass away, but he was 16. It extended it by three years. Right. Um, right. And also, you know, I was giving it to friends suddenly um, who had dogs with epilepsy. Epilepsy is very common in dogs. The number of seizures a dog would have would go down from six seizures a day to maybe one a month. Okay. So it's anecdotal, but all the pet owners who buy from us are religious about giving CBD to their animals. And um, 
the amount of testimonials we have from dog owners is incredible. And, mm -hmm. you know, knowing that we're giving it to dogs and humans, we are so strict about it being organic. There's no THC, which is the psychoactive component, tetrahydrocannabinol of, mm -hmm. of cannabis. Um, although that also has its benefits for dogs in smaller doses. Um, but we are strictly a, a THC free CBD product for dogs and, um, and they love it. So it, it tastes great. We have also a vegan bacon flavor in our oil. Mm -hmm. So the dog loves a, a bacon flavor. So um, we... Do, do they understand what's going on? I mean, do they understand that this effect is, uh, is based on what they just took or like, can they ask for more or they basically just don't <laughs> notice the I consequence? I have, I have one client and the dog does ask for it. She takes out the bottle, the dog comes and literally um, licks the, the pipette, the, go, the, okay. the drop. So, right. um, but mostly it's put in their food and they don't notice the flavor and dogs naturally love oil. They love coconut okay. oils. Uh, you put a little olive oil in your dog's food. It's actually very good for their, for their coats as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, th there's, it, it was a very easy transition and, um, and we also have CBD pet treats. So it's actually a, a cookie with CBD in it for dogs okay. and they love that as well. So. I'm really, I'm really excited about our pet line. It's now become in the US about 62% of our sales are for pets because mm -hmm. I really put a lot of effort into, we've, my team and I have put a lot of effort into um, really exploring the benefits, sponsoring studies, working with veterinarians and filming as many testimonials as possible. So I guess you can say we're, we're passionate about our animals to say the least. <laughs> Right. Um, what's the business model of your suppliers? I mean, I know you have different suppliers. What's the business model? Are they just growing it? Are they manufacturing it? How many layers of supply there is actually? Do they have their own brands? Tell me a couple of words about that. So it's interesting because CBD has become, it was started as a very fragmented um, industry. You had your hemp cultivators, you had your brokers, uh, extractors, and then finished goods manufacturers. Mm -hmm. But now more and more, because uh, like any industry with loss of competition, there's more cons consolidation. So what we're seeing now is basically the, the, my supplier is also the cultivator and the extractor. It's a full mm -hmm. service function. And I okay. like that because it gives me seed to sale traceability. I know exactly okay. every step of the process and I don't like complicated supply chains. If you can develop a relationship with one person who's responsible for um, you know, cultivating, uh, extracting, formulating, and production, then you'll save yourself so much headache. If, right. The further back you need to go, and especially if you're dealing with regulatory and legal frameworks around the world, you need access to that information like that. And you need someone that has every step of the process documented. So that's what I've developed in both the US and Europe. I don't like to uh, window shop and I don't like to go to multiple stores. I like to mm -hmm. get everything in one place, build a lasting relationship. And if it costs a few cents more, or sorry, a few cents per milligram more to, uh, cause we, we measure CBD in, 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 in milligrams in oil, um, or if it costs uh, slightly more to have that convenience, I strongly recommend doing it because you save yourself so many headaches in the long run. Um, and that's basically what I have. I have turnkey solutions on both continents. So okay. you make your life easier. There's no need to find your own raw material and then bring it to a manufacturer when also it's the manufacturers who are in touch with the best cultivators who grow the best material in my case. Um, so I'm, I'm very happy with, with having kind of, uh, turnkey supply chain that I, and I, I just have one person I need to call if there's an issue. All right. What's the global situation with this right now? I know in some countries it's completely illegal. In some it's completely legal. It's some, it must be a gray area. Some countries are probably coming up the next ones who are to legalize that. What's the global situations? The situation, so, there are well, like 200 countries in the world. How many of them are okay for you to do business with? 
a lot of them and surprisingly yeah. so. Um, so it's funny, every week we hear about, an, every week, I would say every month we hear about a new country legalizing cannabis or making, legalizing CBD. The thing is, between that announcement of it's legal and an actual framework on how it's going to be sold, you right. always look at about one to two years. Because, okay. because you can announce tomorrow that cannabis is legal, but unless there's a way, a protocol for it to be sold to the public, consumed by the public, don't forget, you have to change regulations, perhaps around driving, around um, you know, how far from schools it can be smoked or consumed. So mm -hmm. just because we hear that something's legal doesn't mean that it's you know, a, a gold rush and everyone can rush in and start selling tomorrow. Right. Um, that's, that's probably one of the biggest obstacles. With CBD, we found a little bit of a loophole because we're selling a nutraceutical product in many countries that is not legal and not illegal. So how do you okay. criminalize something that's just not on the books? For years in, um, in Europe, hemp extracts were considered a novel food. And that's okay. what we're, we're going back to. So a lot of companies now are applying for what's called novel food licenses mm -hmm. and trying to get themselves listed as novel food suppliers. Um, they have to show every step of the supply chain. Um, and in many cases, um, they're starting to show pharma grade production, which means that they can show that this product is not just a nutraceutical supplement produced in a food grade facility, it's an actual pharma product. Okay. And that's where the industry is headed. Um, I'm a little bit in the, on the fence because I like in some countries in Europe, especially being in the gray market, because I like to let other people make the mistakes first. I used to okay. make the mistake. Now I let other people make the mistakes because I think that we'll see another change in the legislation. There'll be something else that comes up and another set of laws will need to follow. So I'm not in a rush to follow any legal legal registrations right now in England, in the, in the UK, uh, or I've registered my products, no problem in Europe, but also with Brexit, I was very skeptical about the new CBD regulations there. They wanted something like 50,000 pounds just to submit the first application. So I okay. thought, you know, I'll let other people do it, see how it <laughs> goes and then follow their lead. Um, right. I'm, I've got a big enough market online. I've got enough stores and, and places to sell. I don't need to go chasing approval by a government that will change its mind at some point. Is there a specific reason why you chose to have one supplier in Europe and one supplier in the US? Yes, because import, importing from the US is a headache and a half. And not just CBD. It's funny. People think that just because it has cannabis in it, that's why it can't enter Europe. No, there are so many uh, factors of why products are rejected, uh, especially anything you consume orally from the US. So I would bring in shipments and I've had, this is another nightmare I've had a few times was bringing in huge shipments and then having to be turned away you know, by UPS, by DHL. And usually right. it had nothing right. to do with the CBD. It was simply because there was some uh, ingredient that mm -hmm. could not be uh, registered in the EU, like the coconut oil, or I would send melatonin in, mm -hmm. and melatonin isn't legally allowed. So, so it was just easier for me to avoid, first of all, horrendous import taxes, uh, shipping problems on that theme of making your life easier. Find somewhere right. you can easily get to in Europe that can you can check the production. For me to go to Barcelona to my production in the U.S. is easy, and I really enjoy going there. So I, I prefer to keep it separate. Um, also ecological. I mean, when you really think about it, I, I don't love the idea when I'm saying plants, not pills, we're sustainable, we're all organic, and suddenly I'm shipping products, you know, thousands of miles, you know, for the emissions factor as well. Right. It's not very sustainable. So... Trying, trying to be a little bit more conscious about that as well. Makes sense. Makes sense. Um, do you have any more fun stories to share? I mean, this story about you losing a million and a half dollars will make the headlines. Anything more like that? Well, I can tell you a million stories like this. So um, <laughs> we exhibited at the uh, London CBD Expo last year, just before, no, okay. 2000. 
July, 2019. And mm -hmm. I created an incredible stand, spent about 10,000 pounds on a beautiful booth and made, um, made the style of the booth an old, old, old fashioned candy store. So it looked like an okay. old candy store from the 19th century. And I had in each like jar, I had capsules. I had my sexual enhancement capsules for men, sexual enhancement for women. I had my capsules of melatonin for sleep. And then a policeman walked by and said, what's that? And I said, oh, that's CBD with melatonin. Do you want a sample? And he said, this is illegal. You cannot have melatonin and CBD. And it wasn't the CBD, it was the melatonin. You cannot right. offer melatonin just like that. So suddenly I had to basically take $3,000 worth of samples and just trash them as well. So that was, that was a shock. That was, that was one story I remember very well. Another story is um, going to the Las Vegas porn convention to promote my sexual enhancement capsules. It was the Porn Star Awards and they were, um, they were representing my brand, my sexual enhancement capsules. And that was a very, very interesting um, experience because it was like being on another planet of just, um, you know, porno and porn stars. And, and right. this business will take you into so many unexpected places. Um, I remember, um, I just remember going to my first meetings in, uh, in uh, Tennessee with my manufacturer and landing in the wrong part of the state and having to take a Greyhound bus eight hours in the middle of the night in the mm -hmm. scariest conditions possible, trying to get to my manufacturer. Um, so there's, there's just, it's, a ne it's been a never ending stream of, of, of adventures. Uh, I, I had to bring back samples to Canada when CBD was still illegal. So I remember traveling back to Canada from Tennessee with two big suitcases of my CBD, praying I wouldn't be stopped at the border and arrested. <laughs> I've done that a lot. I've, I've traveled places in the world where it's not like legal, but I'm right. always the guy with the extra suitcase. And if someone stops me, oops, I didn't know. So you have to be fearless. And I think that um, being in this industry the way we are and be, seeing who's successful in the industry are people who just don't care and they just go for it and they do it. What I learned down the road is that um, risk is amazing. I'm not risk adverse, but make calculated risks and do your homework. So um, wisdom, wisdom comes the hard way, but, um, but it, it's, it's, it's going well. I mean, we do great. We make, you know, we're probably one of the most profitable in the Southeast uh, USA where we're based and, um, and it pays the bills. And if you can do the, pay the bills doing something you love, then, then, you know, why not? I think you're having a lot of fun being in the business that many people see as somewhat controversial. Of and course. surely, surely not traditional. So, so I'm, Definitely. I'm sure you, you, you're having a lot of fun. Uh, nice. Uh, a question that I love to ask, uh, most businessmen that I meet, what's your favorite book in business, or you can name a couple. Um, you know what, this is going to sound so cheesy, but how to win friends and influence people by Dale. Carnegie. Gotcha. Right. That's my favorite one. That changed my life. Um, and then on the flip side, uh, I strongly recommend the 48 Laws of Power. So the 48 mm -hmm. Laws of Power was published, I think, last year. And it gives examples from everyone from Machiavelli to Aristotle on how to maintain and deliver your power more forcefully without mm -hmm. being biased, of course. But right. there were so many tips that changed my world just about when to speak when not to speak i'm a naturally very enthusiastic person and I, i'm a natural sharer and i want to come across as warm and I, I think i am a warm person and just about learning restraint you know not everyone needs to be your best friend and not everyone is going to not everyone needs to like you and that yeah. book yeah 48 laws of power i strongly recommend to anyone business business books um there's so many pains out there, but I did like Rich Dad, Poor Dad when it came to right. money management. I think that was mm -hmm. a very, very well-written book. And um, I still have a million recommendations I have yet to read, but um, I'm too busy doing business to actually read them. <laughs> so. I think that Dale Carnegie's book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, it doesn't get as, as much credit as it deserves because of the name of the book which sounds mm. a little bit too cliche and naive. And that's because it was written 
I think in the fifties, way before business literature started flooding the markets. So it was perceived very differently back then. But I think because of the name of the book, many people will think, man, this is another, you know, how to be successful in life story. While it's actually such, such a great book that I think in the last 60 years or however long since it's been written, there has never been one that's better on the subject. And even though it's not in business, all the business people love it because yeah. it's about working with people. Right. It's about working with people. And that's ultimately what we are. We're, we're, we're still social creatures. Best business I've done is face to face. People need to smell you. They need to feel you. They need to understand that you're genuine. Um, right. You know, that's why this, this pandemic, I've seen so many amazing people losing business because of course it's, it, there's, there isn't that same level of trust. You know, I still like um, meeting people face to face. Definitely. It, there's one thing also I'd like to add to this conversation on the same lines, because you asked about books. I strongly recommend anyone who has had any issues with sobriety or addiction, who does mm -hmm. want to do business, to really address that. Because I see in my industry, for example, because it's a new industry, because it's a dynamic industry, I see a lot of people running a million miles an hour who do indulge in alcohol, who do indulge in certain drug use. And I always want to say to young entrepreneurs, that you know what when you're when you're running a million miles an hour and you're running on a high you're gonna trip and you're gonna fall so i always strongly recommend to people also address before you start a big project before you go into business address your personal issues address anything you have with substances address any emotional dependency issues you have because those things are going to constantly pop up in your professional life and they're gonna you know in some cases seriously harm your judgment unless you have it you know, taken care of before you, before you enter business. So on that note, I was also going to recommend uh, Alan Carr's guide to uh, stop drinking. Um, okay. And, you know, I, I really do believe that a lot of entrepreneurs need to be, especially when starting out completely clear headed. I mean, this is your life now. Absolutely. Absolutely. If it wasn't CBD, what's your second favorite type of business that you would start? Oh gosh, I don't know. Um, well, I always thought I would uh, do something in the um, writing space. I've always loved to write. I've always loved to be creative. So probably fiction. And one day I will actually sit down and focus on working on a novel or something that um, that that uh, that is a creative pursuit, a story. I would love to tell a story. So so definitely something along those lines. Um, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. But right now it's, it's cannabis, cannabis, cannabis. And uh, now, now that we're in Latin America, um, I'm really excited about just opening new markets and, and seeing where else we can take our products. I think that your passion for writing and your passion with this uh, sort of business can converge into, into a very nice book about pioneering in the cannabis business. Oh, fingers crossed. Well, thank you yes. so much, Mr. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was Gabriel Spilt with CBD company Plants Not Pills. Gabriel, it was super awesome. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, and I guess we'll uh, talk in a year or so to check on how your business is going. Yeah, yeah, I can't wait. And uh, well, we'll see each other soon. Absolutely. Thank you. Take Bye. Bye. Bye.